We've been in a series, The Spirit of Christmas. And today we're going to be talking about the spirit of Christmas and that it never gives up. And we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2 today. And we're going to just see how this probably familiar message on Christmas can talk to us a little bit this morning. But one of the main points I'd like to get across this morning would be the big idea that the spirit of Christmas never gives up bringing Jesus to a time and place for worship and for witness. One of the things I've been thinking about is this idea of what it means to really never give up on somebody. I've been thinking about people who are in my life who have never given up on me, even when I was acting immaturely, uh, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. <laughs> Having people believe in you is nice, right? We kind of all like that. Whether it be a coworker or someone that's a friend of ours, um, people at our job, family. But sometimes when we see the potential in someone, you say to yourself, I'm going to do everything I can to help that person grow. I'm going to do what I can. I can't tell you how many times uh, my wife would say to me, babe, you can do it. Uh, didn't mean that it was going to be easy. Not at all. Because it would actually require hard work and sacrifices. But being able to stay the course was her believing in me many times. And one of the things I wanted to get across this morning for us would be this, is that I think Christmas, I mean, many of us come expecting messages and, and you write and certain themes we talk about, but I think the Christmas message is really about never giving up on a dream. I think that's what the Christmas message is really about. It's about having a dream and making a sacrifice to make it come true. We don't think normally of Christmas being centered around a dream. I don't think we do that often. We normally think of Christmas around some of our family traditions. We think about the decorations and the songs we sing and the family getting together and putting up the tree and hearing songs in the malls or whatever it is and spending your money. But some of us have traditions that sometimes change. Uh, some of you have adult children, I have adult children, and when they married, my prayer was that they would continue the traditions I taught them in Christmas. They did some of them, but we know that traditions happen, and some traditions change, and some dreams are dashed. As many of you know, uh, the day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday, my wife found our son Jason dead uh, from an overdose. And, and so for 13 years, we battled this drug addiction. We fought hard. Oh, jeez. Uh, we had several conversations with our boy. We told him uh, many times to hold on to the dream, the dream of being free and the dream of, of living life the way you were raised. Uh, and there were times when my son was free, and we would live in that dream, and we would enjoy the dream. Uh, many of you and some came to his service a couple weeks ago, and there, there were people that I had done your services, where we buried your children. And there were some I chased and got off drugs, and some of them were here in the last service especially, seeing them. But we know this in our family that Christmas now will be different. We also know that we are part of so many of you who have lost somebody too. And we've read some of your letters. But I want to say the reason why this is a dream is that I can tell you this. I can tell you that we have a God who gets this dream. And he understands what it is to have a dream dashed. God knows what it's like to have a dream actually change. Like we had our dream changed. And when the dream changed in our lives, it changed so much of our life. 
But when God created man, he created them in his image, male and female. And when he created us, guys, he created us. And with great delight, he said it was good. And so the father took great delight in the fact that the second person of the Trinity, God, his son, would actually walk with man in the garden and have joy. This was his vision. And it put a smile on his face. But Adam and Eve sinned and stepped out of God's dream, and they actually entered into a nightmare. I believe they were probably the most depressed people to ever walk the planet, going from glory and stepping into death, stepping into a life addicted to sin. So the dream of the father changed, but his heart for that dream didn't change. The relationship with the son of God changed, but his actions for the dream did not change. So why, people, do we get together this weekend and why will many of you come to the Christmas Eve services this weekend? Is because we're gonna hear a story about a God, the Father, who never gives up on us. And so when you invite people to that service, may you never give up on anybody. And the reason why we know that is because of Jesus' birth and life and resurrection, we will see the the new earth and the fullness and then we will be able to walk with God in his glory again. And so that means what I'm going to be sharing with you as we look at Luke chapter 2 is the Christmas story telling us how we can start to walk with God again in his vision. And so the spirit of Christmas never gives up bringing Jesus to a time and place. And so we look first at the time, and the time was this. It was described in verse 1 through 3, where the spirit of Christmas never gives up in real time. And in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree and census taken to, or to be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Crinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went there own to their own town to register. Notice in verse one, it says, in those days. In those days, life was normal. The events were just going on. I know what it's like to go to the store and and think to myself, it just looks normal here. But for me, it's abnormal. It doesn't look normal to me. And at Jesus' birth, it was abnormal. But it wasn't an abnormal of pain. It was an abnormal of what was coming that was going to be joy. And so Caesar Augustus, who was adopted by Julius Caesar and a military leader who was also known to be called the savior of the world. In those days, God was in control in those days. And that's why he starts off with those days because the author wants us to know that in those days, God is in control of the nations and God is in control of these events, even though it doesn't seem like it. And that God is a God who will keep his promises. And that God said that the child will be born in Bethlehem and he moved nations to make sure of it. He even prophesied about it 700 years prior to Jesus' birth in Micah 5 when he gives a prophecy that the Messiah, the Son of God, will be born in Bethlehem. And so what is the point when we just look at those first three verses? This is the point I want to share with us, church, is this. In Proverbs 21, 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. No man can stop the plans of God. His plan is going to happen. He knows our day and he knows our hour and he knows our future. So Christ will be born and no ruler will stop him. Christ will come again and no ruler will stop him. And Christ will reign again on this earth and no army will stop it. And we can trust God's promises because in Numbers 23, it says, God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? People, you and I, even though things look like they're just out of tilt, and we say, why God? We can trust the future, even though the future now is bleak for some, and we can also trust the present, 
because he's promised. But the spirit of Christmas never gives up in real place. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, as was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. All of this time is hard. This seems like the whole promise in which was to be fulfilled wasn't easy. It was hard. And the first part that gives a description of how hard it was was in verse 4. Notice, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Why does that show hard? Because it's there that this little teenage girl, nine months pregnant, travels 80 miles on the back of a donkey because the Roman government wanted there to be a census where they could tax the people. And they would go to the census if you were to have a census taken of you. For the Romans, you could actually stay in Rome. But the government allowed the Jewish people to do something different. They wanted them to go see to the place of their ancestors. And so this is why Mary and Joseph went to the town of Bethlehem because of David, who was part of their ancestry. And so that was the challenge in, in the travel. But also the conditions were hard. There was no room available at all. Because of the census, the little town of David was full of census takers, so all of the rooms were taken these rooms were not like hotels at all. They were like campgrounds. This town was only used for salesmen who would stop by shortly and then put their animals in the stables. But they were full, and Mary and Joseph could only stay where the animals were. The place was hard, but the birth was hard. And so in verse 6, it says, The time came for the baby to be born. I have six kids. And I know what it's like to anticipate their birth. I know what it's like to anticipate the adoption. I know what it's like while your wife is giving birth to the child. You, you pace back and forth in anticipation. I know what it's like to anticipate the birth of each one of my grandchildren. And I know what it's like to have my firstborn be born. And I looked at him and I thought, well, he'll look better in time. And he hasn't. I can say that because he doesn't go to church here. He goes somewhere else. So he should have stayed, huh? But the birth was hard. And Mary and Joseph, when they traveled, she could have actually stayed in Nazareth. But God made sure that the two of them came. And the reason why she was not left alone was because her family did not understand her pregnancy. They didn't understand the vision that Gabriel gave to both Joseph and Mary. And that she would give birth to the Son of God. And that she would be a virgin until the birth. And they didn't believe it. But at the birth of Jesus, Mary experienced something hard. There was no mom with her. Her mother wasn't there in the birth. Her father wasn't there to pray with her. There wasn't any relatives celebrating. It was hard, hard travel, hard place, hard birth. But what's the point? I think we're reminded of man's sinful condition, aren't we? In Romans 8, it says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. When Jesus was born in the stable, it reminds us of the condition of humanity in sin. That's why he came to that place. And we also notice a world that goes on with everyday life and ignores the fact that Jesus is alive. In John 1, it says, he was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't even recognize him. 
People, it's easy for you and I to leave from here and do our shopping and anticipate the meal. But I tell you, it's real easy to just live as though he's not alive. He is alive. And also we can remember this, that suffering here. In the same way it was for Mary and Joseph, suffering is unavoidable. Romans 80 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. People, we suffer because we also know individuals who are suffering, don't you? We suffer from a child who might be living in rebellion and you hurt for them and you chase them down and you don't give up, but your heart is in pain. And we suffer sometimes because of family conflicts or maybe friendships that have failed. And sometimes we suffer because we believe in Jesus. But we're reminded that God is present at all times and in all places. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? But the spirit of Christmas never gives up, bringing us to worship and to witness. We first look at worship. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. The spirit of Christmas never gives up bringing worship and witness. But what about the worship? There's worship first at his birth. Notice in verse 6 it says, And she gave birth to the firstborn. In the beginning, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, walked with man in the garden. This was the dream of the Father. And at that time, he appeared to man in theophany form. He walked with them. He talked with them. He was glorified through them. But this birth is different. It's God becoming man. It's the second person of the Trinity becoming one with us. Why? Because of the Father's dream. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So he didn't give up on the dream. Why do we do that? This is the highest point of all history, the birth of the Son of God. The earth was silent. The earth brought no worship at all. The earth had misplaced worship. But only a few noticed. Some noticed and they pondered. Mary and Joseph noticed, but they were by themselves. But I want to tell you one of the greatest events that took place when the heavens noticed and worshiped. And it was in a scream. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. This is the second highest pinnacle in human history. At the first was the birth of the Son of God. Now people, tens of thousands of angels appeared. Now prior to this, Gabriel appeared to Mary and then to Joseph in a dream. But this event is different than any event in all of history. Because the appearance of angels before could have been seen in visions or where the eyes could one day open and they could see him in the sky, but it was here. Tens of thousands of angels planted their feet on this planet and began to praise a God who was six miles away from them. This was one of the largest events in angel history. This was the Father never giving up on a dream for humanity, and the angels scream in worship. And for the very first time in all creation, with the presence of Jesus, grace is in full motion. And the angels never understood this, and yet angels were called to protect. But one of the things you'll notice in this passage is that angels proclaim, 
They scream and praise what they're proclaiming. In verse 10, it says, they proclaimed the good news. In verse 11, they proclaimed the prophecy, he'll be born in Bethlehem. In verse 12, they proclaimed a sign. A sign's going to be given to you. And in verse 11, they proclaimed Christ's coming. And today in the heavens, in Revelation 5, they still proclaim Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. What is the point of worshiping in the spirit of Christmas? What is the point of it? We worship because we've been saved by grace. Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is a gift. Christmas is a gift to us. I remember when I first became a believer in Jesus, my eyes saw a dream that was much different than the dream I had for myself. Because God is a God who brings a dream to you. We're saved by grace. It's a gift. And we worship even when the pain is so deep that the words that I share with God do not make sense. In Romans 8, it says, in the same way the Spirit helps in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for us through wordless groans. You can be in a condition and the Holy Spirit at that moment, at that time, will receive your worship, even though you do not know what words to say. And we worship because God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. In 1 John 1, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins. You can worship him. People, every one of us in this room have relapsed. Every one of us. Now you might not show it on the outside, but we've done it in our hearts. We've done it at times where we want to pull away from the dream of the Father. And the Father doesn't give up on you. I remember two nights before my son passed came to us and said he was he had relapsed and we held his hand and first words out of his mouth were mom dad I'm sorry forgive me and we just looked at him and said but we can do this we've done it before hold on to the dream and people this is what I think the father says to us when we relapse stay in the fight Hold on to the Father's dream by the movement of the Holy Spirit that moves you. And worship him because he forgives you. We worship because he never leaves us or forsakes us. But we too can witness. That when the angels had left them and gone into heaven... The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The witness. Now, who are these shepherds? The shepherds were the most uneducated, least skilled, lowest paid. As a matter of fact, they were despised by the religious leaders because they would actually work on the Sabbath day to take care of the sheep so that the wolves wouldn't take their lives. But what was so special about these shepherds? Actually, nothing at all. They lived about six miles from Jerusalem so that people could come there and buy sheep to make their sacrifices in the temple. And I think that these shepherds had such a true belief in the coming of the Messiah that they knew why people were coming to buy their sheep for the sacrificing in the temple and it moved their heart and their understanding of who was going to be the true Lamb of God. And it created in them an anticipation to be saved from their sins. 
This is why I believe the angels came to these shepherds. They provided for the temple. And these angels came and they showed up with their friends, the true believers. And they came to him and told him that, guess what? That savior that you guys just love, you can go see him. He's six miles from here. And so they took off and they were to make the first visitation. So when you witness Jesus, let me tell you, it's life changing. And so when the shepherds heard the message that Christ had come, life changed for them. The first thing they did as witnesses was they believed. In verse 15, how did they believe? Let's go. No one had to lead them. No one had to have them comply. They just picked up and left. And I really don't know who was taking care of the sheep when they took off. Maybe the angels kind of stuck around and took care of them. Second thing they did as witnesses is they pursued. Verse 16 says they hurried and they found Mary. What did they do? They believed the sign. Do you believe the sign that Micah spoke of in chapter 5? The son will be born in Bethlehem. They didn't argue with the signs and the prophecies. They just left. And they evangelized in verse 17. And when they had seen him, they spread the word. People, these shepherds were the very first evangelists for Jesus, not the disciples. They went and they spread the word. I can only imagine how fast they must have been talking when they were telling the story. Starting with angels surrounding them and and telling how they had seen the Messiah. And they reached down and they touched his hands and his little toes. And telling how Mary pondered it in her heart. And talking about these angels. They were the first evangelists. And then they just went home. The shepherds in verse 20 just went home. Glorifying God. They returned to being shepherds. They didn't return to the shepherd circuit by selling shepherd books or going to shepherd speaking engagements for what they saw. They just went home. They returned to their job. They returned to their job doing what? Praising God because God had sent the Messiah. So let me end with some of these thoughts for you this morning. I think the question I have for us is what is Christmas for us? What does Christmas do for us? Can I remind you that Christmas is about the Father's dream? Can I remind you that our faith comes by the hearing of God's word and it's a gift? I remember my first Christmas. I remember the first time that I'd come to know Jesus and I saw him differently. We're reminded that we have a personal talking, walking relationship with Jesus as witnesses. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of needs. People we can actually talk to God because of his dream for us in much the same way that Adam did. But we have the Holy Spirit that indwells us and people, you can talk to him. Join in his dream. That's what Christmas is about. And we're reminded that we have good news to tell people about. Be like the shepherds. In Romans 1, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And lastly, we're reminded that our home is a Jesus home. So when you go back to your home, like the shepherds, you just go back. Go back changed. But do me a favor. With your home, If you have sons and you have daughters, no matter what their age is, never give up on them. Chase them, text them, 
Call them. Want them? Never give up. Hang on to one another. One thing I know for sure is that the Father never gave up on us. So he didn't give up on you. So don't give up on him. And this I do know is that this Christmas is definitely going to be different for my family for sure. But some of you have that too. In all the services, I've had people come up who've been telling me whether they've lost somebody just this last year or struggling with drugs. Uh, We had, they didn't even know it, but this last service, a teen challenge showed up with 40 people. They decided God wanted them to come to the service this last hour. They had no idea. And here they came. And I was able to hug them and pray with them. They are alive. They're going to trust the Father's dream. So this Christmas, we'll still have joy in our family. But the joy is going to be in Christ, not in pain. Can I pray for you? God, as we end in worship and song right now, I pray, Father, that you would target our hearts, that we would worship you, not to sound good, but to really bring you the praise in the way the angels did. Because we know that the world doesn't recognize you, but we do. So we praise you. And we claim you as our Lord. In Jesus' name.